want to talk about John the Baptist, in particular talk about his preaching. All four of the Gospels record some of his preaching, and it's powerful. He, he is a, a fiery preacher without any question, and I was reminded this week there's a quote from Martin Luther, who you might not think very much about that, the, the founder of Lutheranism, but he, in training young pastors, made a quote and said to them, men, if you will build a fire in the pulpit, people will come and watch you burn. In other words, he was a, an advocate of, of powerful, fiery preaching, and he taught guys that that's what you ought to be able to do. Uh, I don't know if it's always that case. There is a little bit of a difference, for instance, between John's preaching, which is very powerful, very convicting, very harsh, and then the preaching of Jesus. The one full sermon that we have of Jesus we call the Sermon on the Mount is, if you read it, first of all, it only lasts about 17 minutes, so I don't know about preaching for an hour. Uh, Jesus made it on 17 minutes, but he was Jesus. But his preaching was very calm. It was more teaching. Uh, there's a difference. And so I don't know that there's a right way or a wrong way. It's the message that makes the difference. And this is some of John's preaching and his message. So beginning in chapter 3, we'll read verse 1, and then we'll drop down to verse 7. In those days came John the Baptist. He came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And then if you go to verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, it's not so much on how to win friends and influence people, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to, from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Well, the heart of John's preaching in all four of the Gospels, there is this simple message Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's his message, repent. And understand, the concept of repentance is not complicated. It's really simple. The word literally means to turn around. The idea of repentance is you are going in one direction, and you stop going in that direction, and you turn and go a different direction. And actually, the literal sense of it is to turn and go the opposite direction. That's not hard. And basically, John kind of makes the message that everybody, when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, is going in the wrong direction and needs to turn and go in the other direction. In fact, John, literally, if you go farther into the Apostle Paul, he makes it clear and he says, we're all sinners. We're all going in the wrong direction, and we all need to stop, and we need to turn from our sin. It's not a hard concept, but it doesn't mean that it's an easy thing to do. Repentance begins with the awareness that you're going in the wrong direction. In other words, you have to be thinking about your spiritual condition, and that's maybe what John, more than anything else, said I want you to be thinking about your spiritual condition. And honestly, on a different kind of Sunday, maybe this is not a bad day for those of us in this room to say, well, maybe today I need to be thinking about my spiritual condition. And this idea of being aware that you're going in the wrong direction. My kind of classic experience goes back like 35 or 37 years. Karen and I, when we got out of seminary, went to Chicago. And uh, the Tri-State Tollway was still under construction. 
it is still under construction today. They still haven't got it finished. I mean, it's still always under construction. But we were on the Tri-State Tollway, and I was driving, and I was trying to get to another church for a meeting, and uh, the signs were not really good. And evidently, I missed the sign and suddenly saw a billboard that said, Welcome to Indiana. I was not trying to go to Indiana. In fact, I was about, to, so the reality is for about 15 miles, I was going in the wrong direction and was completely clueless. Now granted, for most of us spiritually, we may be going in the wrong direction and may not be aware of it, but that's part of what preaching and the Holy Spirit is about, that God in His love for us loves us enough to make us aware of the direction we're going in to tell us you're going in the wrong direction. In fact, a part of salvation is that a willingness to know and be aware that I'm going the wrong direction, and more than that, to be willing to admit it. Now, sometimes it's a big deal that when it comes to being saved, when it comes to being born again, I believe you have to confess and admit your sin. In fact, I don't think you and I can be saved without confession. And the word confession literally means to agree. God knows if you're going in the wrong direction. All you're doing is saying, God, I know I'm going in the wrong direction. I know I'm not living the way I'm supposed to live. I know that I'm not obeying you. I know that. That's the admission part. And most of us don't like to admit that we're going in the wrong direction. In fact, I know guys who, when they're lost and their wife tells them they're lost, will say, we're going to get there. I know exactly where I'm going. I'm not lost. We don't like to admit that. In fact, while we're doing full disclosure, let me just tell you, in the first service, as a part of our analogy, sometimes we need to do big-time repentance and turn around and go in the other direction. Sometimes it's more subtle. We have a van that has... Lane drift warning. You, you understand what I mean? That it's got an automatic deal that if you have it on and you start to just veer a little bit off course, it beeps and it tells you you're drifting in and out of your lane. Now, I in the first service at this moment just went ahead and said, I don't like that. I don't even need it. I have a wife. Why do I need that? And then I realized that sometimes you say stuff in sermons that you probably shouldn't have said. But since I said it in the first service, I thought I ought to just mention it. I think actually I used the phrase, that's going to come back to bite me. That's what I, I think I said. So I will mention it. But, but that idea of sometimes all of us need to repent. All of us need to repent in terms of salvation. But all of us as Christians struggle with sometimes drifting. Where maybe I'm not terrible, but I, I know better than this. Or I've stopped doing some of the things I know I ought to do. Or I've, I've stopped doing certain things. Or I know there's, that I've kind of drifted. And the Holy Spirit will make us aware of those things. But once we're aware, then you've got to be willing to admit it. And that's why 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we need to admit that we are not going in the right direction. But, but then there's something more to that, that once we've admitted it, we've got to be willing to do something about it. There's, there's kind of an interesting situation in that there was a group of people who came out to hear John preach, Pharisees, priests, scribes, teachers of the law. And by the way, he greets them with kind of a really sarcastic statement. I mean, they show up and he says, Oh, hey, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, the sarcasm of that is they were there. They didn't think there was anything wrong in their life. They thought they were perfectly fine. They thought they were great because they were Jews. And so that's why that statement of, well, listen, God can make Jews out of rocks. He not, just being a Jew doesn't mean you're right. He said, you've got to deal with things yourself. And this idea of being willing to admit your own need for salvation. I, I, it came to me in kind of a, in the first service mentioned at the end, but uh, there's an old story about a Sunday with the snow. And there was a, a pastor who had a guy who was in his church every week. And every Sunday, he would meet him at the back door, shake the pastor's hand, and would every week say, 
Well, pastor, you sure told them today. And so it kind of got the pastor ticked that the guy was always, well, you always told them. So there was a winter Sunday where the only guy who showed up was that guy. And so the pastor preached the entire Bible to him. Had him there. He was the only one in the congregation. Told him everything. And then prayed and went and stood at the back and waited for the guy to come. And the guy came back and shook his hand and said, Pastor, if they'd have been here, you'd have sure told them. <laughs> well, this, this idea, and, and there was those kind of guys who came to John. Repentance is a question of you and I individually hearing and knowing that spiritually we're maybe not going in the right direction and admitting it and then deciding to do something about it. That decision to say, I know I'm not where I ought to be. I, I know I'm not going in the right direction and I'm willing and ready to turn. And sometimes that's difficult. That's not easy. It's hard to admit that we're sinners. It's hard to acknowledge it. But the really tough issue is the deciding. And so John, given by God, had this amazing sense of baptism. Baptism for repentance. Baptism is an action that helps you to say, I am not going to be the same. I am going to turn. And I understand there's all kinds of different churches look at things different ways. I don't believe that the Jordan River water washes anybody's sins away. But the idea of a heart willing to confess and expect and acknowledge their sin and willing to turn the act of baptism became the symbol of this decision to go in a different direction. And not only to go in the different direction, but to be a different person. In fact, John, in his preaching, talks often about this idea of the fruits of repentance. That if you're going to go in a different direction, you ought to live differently. There ought to be an example. There ought to be a sense that once you and I become Christians, we ought to live different. That once something's changed in our lives and we've made a decision, somehow there ought to be fruits of repentance. In fact, in his preaching in chapter Luke, the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke, as he's preaching about repentance, there are people coming and they're being baptized, and then they say, so John, what do we do now? And his first response is, well, you ought to be generous. If you've got two coats and you know somebody doesn't have any, you ought to only have one coat and they ought to have your spare. Or if you find somebody and you've got plenty to eat and they don't have anything to eat, you ought to be able to help them. He says, your life ought to change. Then there were tax collectors that came. And he said, well, John, if we repent, what should we do as tax collectors? And basically he says, well, don't cheat anybody. Be honest in all of your business dealings. Be honest in your finances. In fact, there's even a thing where soldiers come. And they say, well, if, if we repent, John, what should we do? And he says to them, well, do your job to the best of your ability. Do what you're supposed to do. Obey your commanders and be content with your wages. But every bottom, the bottom line is that if we genuinely have repented and we've really said we're going to follow God, then there ought to be some changes in our lives. We ought to live differently. There ought to be some real example. When I was in college, uh, there was a, a group that was handing out cards on campus. And the card was just kind of a simple little thing, but it had the question, if it were against the law to be a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I never thought about that, but it was the simple idea. Well, if I'm a Christian, if I've really been saved, if I've really repented, if I've really come to the kingdom of heaven, is there any evidence in my life that says that? Now, the fact that you're here on a day when there's lots of Christians that are not even going to church and lots of churches that are not meeting, that's probably a pretty good sign for you. But the idea is there ought to be repentance, and there is no salvation without repentance. There's no godly Christian life without casual and regular and almost daily repentance, changing my course, realizing I've drifted off and getting back in my lane and driving in the way that I ought to be going. And there ought to be fruits. There ought to be something to prove that I'm a Christian. So John's main message was repent. Basically, examine your spiritual life and see if you're going where you ought to be. But then when he says to repent, repent, 
More importantly, he says, when you turn from your sin, you need to turn to Jesus. There's somebody coming who's mightier than I. I'm baptizing you with water. That's a good thing. That's a good sign. And certainly in the next chapter, Jesus is going to go and he's going to be baptized. He's going to tell us it's a good thing to do. And we'll talk about that in some weeks to come. But bottom line is, when he says there's somebody coming, he's going to baptize you in an entirely different way. He's going to baptize you spiritually. He's going to be able to transform you with the power and the Spirit of God that you and I can be transformed from the inside. By the way, this changing is really hard. To say, I've had this habit and that's been a part of my life for all of my life. How do I change that? Sometimes it's an act of the will, but Jesus is the one who can help us to change. But then more than that, his, his message was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, there's an urgency because something's going to happen. And then he has this story, and almost all of the Gospels record this idea of Jesus having a winnowing fork in his hand. So I want to talk about that for just a minute. Um, somebody selling grain. Harvest, it's a good deal. We're in favor of harvest. But harvest in biblical days was a lot different. Most of the grain they grew was barley or wheat. They had millet. Uh, but mostly it was stalks that had a head on the end of it. And on the head there was lots of little grains kind of in a, in a casing. And so when they would get ready to uh, harvest, they would go through the field with a knife. And they would reach down and they'd grab a, a group of those grain heads, and they would cut them off at the ground. And then they would sort of bind them together with a sheave. By the way, bringing in the sheaves, isn't there an old hymn to that extent? We shall cut. Well, basically, they would take all of those stalks of grain, a big armful, they tie them together, and they would take them into a threshing floor. Now, a threshing floor was pretty much just a rocky, flat space. Normally a, a just solid rock, big circle or big area, and they would be the threshing floor. And they would start and they'd take all these sheaves and they'd throw them down on the threshing floor. Then they would take big sticks, they would beat them. Then maybe they'd cut off the stalk part to just try and leave the head of the grain and all of its chaff that went with it. And then if it was a big threshing floor, they would get oxen and they'd drag a big timber and they'd drag that timber and they'd drag it over across all of the, the grain and they'd beat on it, they'd work it up. And the reality is that then they would have a big pile of loose kernels of grain and all of the chaff that came off of the head and would all be there. And then would start the process of winnowing. And this is what John says Jesus is ultimately going to do. The winnowing process, of, of they talk about a winnowing fork or like a big shovel, like a big rake. But on a day with just a little bit of a breeze, they would then reach down and scoop up grain and chaff and throw it up into the air. And then the wind would blow. The grain, the heads of grain, the seeds of grain would be heavier and they would fall straight down and the chaff would blow with the wind. And they'd do it again. And they'd do it again. In fact, they would, you know, a big grain, they, they would do it for three or four hours, throw it up and throw it up again and throw it up again. And when they finally finished winnowing, there would be two piles. One pile was the heads of grain. That was what was valuable. That's what he would take and gather and take to the barn. The other pile was all the chaff. Well, the chaff had no value at all, and the chaff would simply be burned. And so when John in his preaching said, you need to repent. You need to get sure that you're going in the right direction. You need to find Jesus and be following him. And the reason you need to be doing that is because when Jesus shows up, there's going to be a separation, a day of judgment. And you're either going to be in the grain pile or you're going to be in the chaff pile. And that's what it means to be in the kingdom of heaven. Now, John's preaching was pretty powerful. 
It was pretty blunt. It was pretty harsh. And yet, in the spite of that, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, verse 18, it says, after using that very same analogy about some people being burned and, and being called away and of no value and some being able to be into, into the barn, into the kingdom of heaven, then it says, and with many other exhortations, John preached the good news. I don't know. That doesn't sound like good news, does it? Or maybe it's the most important news. And the good news is that people going in the wrong direction can turn around. And people who haven't found the kingdom of heaven can find it. And the good news that for sinners who are as far in the wrong direction as you can imagine, there still is hope. Well, today, I hope on this Sunday, you're aware of which direction you're going. That there's that reminder that says, yes, I need to make sure I'm going in the right direction. And by the way, your wife, if you're a guy, will probably remind you when you're going off. Or better yet, the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and just simply says, this is the direction. This is where you need to be going. And if you're out of line, this is the time to come back. So, time for invitation. Time for us to stand and Going to sing about the Pentecostal power. It's a great old hymn. Go ahead and stand up. A great old hymn about the power of God in Jesus Christ to change who we are, to change our direction, and to change where we spend eternity. Let's sing together.